Hey y'all, happy Monday. Uh, it's been a very long day for me, so I'm gonna do a live this evening with Shiro. Um, she is known as Swaddles to Stethoscopes on, or Stethoscopes to Swaddles. No, Swaddles to Stethoscopes. I can't remember. I think it's Stethoscopes to Swaddles um, on Instagram. She's a CRNA. And so we are going to find out uh, all about her and get some of your questions answered. And I'm really looking forward to it. I This is another Instagram uh, friend that I don't personally know. So I am looking forward to hearing her story and getting these questions answered that y'all had for her. So I see she has joined. So I'm going to send her an invite. Hello. <laughs> I was like, what did I do wrong? Hi. How Hi, are you? So good. Okay. Am I doing this right? Okay, yeah. You are. You look perfect. <laughs> Love Thank your you. glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You look amazing. I was like, I got off work today, and I was like, I don't feel like doing the work today, so you get what you get. <laughs> Girl, I'm right there with you. I'm like, as soon as we get off of this, I'm going to bed. <laughs> you know what? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, and my daughter and I were visiting my mom in Kansas all of last week, so we went from, like, my mom just basically waits on us, like, we don't do anything. And I come home and I'm like, who's going to hand me a cup of tea? Oh, me. <laughs> I'm it. <laughs> don't you love it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for agreeing to do this. I know, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've been doing these for a while and I'm like, you know, it'd be nice to have some new faces and hear some new stories. So I'm super excited to hear your story thank and, you. uh, and for you to share your knowledge with others. So yeah. thank you. Can I just say like, it's so incredible to me to see, especially women of color showing up and owning the spaces that you're owning. And I know other individuals are doing it too, but it's so amazing to me because one, people can see themselves in you and two you are doing so much work to like ensure that people who want to be CRNAs can get into school but also stay in school and that's something that 10 years ago we didn't really have and so it's amazing it's I just want to applaud you for that because of course it takes courage to show up and, and do that and yeah risk you know being afraid of failing and yeah still doing it well, thank you. Thank you. I know some days I'm like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> nobody's listening to me. Like, but then to, to hear that or, you know, to hear, um, get an inbox in my, in my DMs and say, oh my God, your live last night was so informative. I'm like, okay, now I remember what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's actually funny. Um, Amanda Kay, who is also kind of in the space that you're in, she's one of my coaching clients. And I shared with her an email. It was from one of this, the marketing guru, Seth Godin. And he talked about how, like, if you're a lifeguard at a swimming pool, right, and somebody is drowning, you don't have to be the best lifeguard in town. It's just like your person is drowning and you got to jump in the water and help them. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us that are occupying these spaces, like, you don't have to be the expert in the end all be all. But like, there's one person out there that needs your voice. And if you don't show up for that person, it's literally like saying, sorry, I'm not the best lifeguard in town. I can't jump in the water and save you. Yeah. 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 So, so it's sacred work. It really is. Yeah. And Amanda's yeah. on here. She said, hello. Hey, hi, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I love Amanda. I forget when we did our first live, I, I want to say it was last year or maybe it was even the year before, but she's such a wonderful light worker as well. And so I'm, you know, I'm super excited to just speak to um, different, um, whether it's CRNAs or SRNAs or nurses, like, and just to hear everybody's story and be able to share that. So again, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's get into those questions. Um, and I hear your baby in the back. Don't worry about it. Oh, can you hear her? Occasionally, but don't worry about it. Like oh, I don't. I, I don't want. 
It might nope. be picking it up. The door is nope. locked. She might be knocking on the door. <laughs> oh, well, then yes, we need to go. We need to, we need to no, make sure she's no. okay. <laughs> no, my husband's taking care of that. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, don't worry about that because um, I have two dogs and sometimes they get excited and start making noise. So don't worry about it. It's a very comfortable zone. Um, so if you need to tend to her, please do. All right. <laughs> okay, so the first question that I have for you is tell us about yourself. Okay, so my name is Shira Bergbauer. I am a wife, mom, nurse, nestist, life coach. I wear many, many hats different times of day, um, sister, friend, um, all the things. My greatest joy is being a mother to my three year old daughter, Bella. Um, it's interesting because motherhood is both a learning and a teaching experience. And I get to learn so much about myself and I get to teach her how to be a human. And I was born and raised in Kenya. I, I grew up in Kenya and I moved here when I was 18. And yeah, I'm the first of three. I have a sister, Elizabeth, who is also a nurse. Uh, my brother, James, is in the military. He is mm -hmm. currently based in Qatar. He's on deployment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I am also, quote unquote, the deputy parent. <laughs> um, my, sis, my sister and I are six years apart, so, and my brother and I are eight years apart. So basically, um, they're a deputy parent. Um, yeah, so lived in Kansas when I first moved here, went to nursing school there, got my BSN in Texas, um, worked in neurotrauma ICU. Uh, actually, I did a stint in med search for, what, two years? And then I worked in Neurotrauma ICU, and then I applied to CRNA school, which was kind of a fluke, actually. I had considered going to CRNA school before, and then I changed my mind because I wanted to move back home to Kenya, and I wanted to do an MPH. I actually went to take my GRE to um, apply to Hopkins, which I had toured Hopkins. I loved Hopkins. I wanted to do a master's in public health. And yeah, when I was there, I ran into somebody this guy, Rainier, actually, sorry, gets funnier. And Rainier was like, oh, why are you taking the GRE? And I was like, oh, I want to go do public health. And he's like, why would you do that? I was like, well, I want to move back home and da, 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 And I was like, yeah, I used to actually want to go to CRNA school and change my mind. He's like, why would you do that? And I was like, you know what? I just changed my mind. And so he was like, no, you should, you should totally apply. And so it was on a whim. And so I only, like Baylor College of Medicine at the time was the only program that I didn't need any extra classes. So I was like, okay, why not? And then when I got into it, I was like, oh crap, I'm doing this thing. I am actually doing the thing. And so, yeah, I, and I was already in the ICU because that's kind of how I got into it because I was wanting to go to CRN school and then to totally changed that. And so Rania talked me into it. I applied at Baylor. I still remember going to interview and running into him. And I'm like, this is all your fault. This, this is all you're doing. And he and I ended up being classmates, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we graduated together. Yeah. So I graduated Baylor December of 2011. Um, yeah. And so 10 years, February 20th will be 10 years since I started working my current job at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, Truly, as a Gemini, it's a shock that I have worked anywhere that, that long. I usually change job every two years. And yeah, so 10 years in, I love my patients. When I started at MD Anderson 10 years ago, we were just starting to scratch the surface on ERAS. And we were kind of some of one of the pioneer institutions of enhanced recovery after surgery, you know, doing non-opioid anesthesia, kind of shying away from using anesthetic gas and really like that was like groundbreaking and now it's like oh everybody's doing ERAS right and to be in that to be in that area and to be with those people doing that I mean that has been like amazing for me because I get to see new technologies in anesthesia new practices in anesthesia because of where I am Mm -hmm. And yeah, totally have loved that. Um, and now I am venturing into life coaching. So yeah. as a true Gemini, just changing things. I love that. Amanda's a Gemini too, I believe, if I remember. Oh, is she? I think so. Maybe. Well, I think she's so. later in the year. It's possible. It's I can't possible. remember. I can't Geminis remember. tend to attract, so that's possible. <laughs> My ex-husband's a Gemini. Um. Yeah, we're special. <laughs> <laughs> we come as two. Yes, the twins. Yes. <laughs> so that is that is so interesting to me because 
You're an Aries. Oh, you're an Aries like me. Why did I think yeah. you're a Gemini? <laughs> I'm an Aries that's too. The same, that's why you guys yeah. are in the same squad. Yeah. Um, so I, I will tell you why, why that question about um, are you Kenyan came up. Yeah. Um, and I will connect you with the person who asked because um, it's somebody who I went to CRNA school with. Uh, she was a year behind me. And so she, she personally asked me. And so yes. I, will link, I will link you two together. Yes, please <laughs> do. Yes, I am Kenyan through and through. I still speak my native language, Kikuyu. Actually, I spent a week with my mom. So it's actually a transition. Like today I was like thinking in English and like one, like it, it's a very weird disconnect because <laughs> like in my family, we don't really speak English together. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's not even a thing. Um, and so like, it's like, you know, when you haven't been in school, like from summer break and you go back and you can't remember how to write. Yes. It's kind of the same thing. Like, you know, the thing, but you don't know how to do it. So yeah, I am born and raised. Actually, I recently learned this phrase, born, raised, breaded, buttered, and slightly burned in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what is the language? Kikuyu is my native language. K-I-K-U-Y-U. -K Kikuyu. Kikuyu. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yes, I will definitely link you two up. Um, she's a wonderful individual um, as well. So I'm, I'm sure you two have much in common. Um, yeah. Would you love both, that. Yeah, Kenyan CRNAs. So um, amazing. I love I love being able to connect people. So this is amazing. That is my jam too. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm the kind of person like growing up, I would connect people and they would, they would become best friends and people would be like, oh, doesn't that make you sad? I'm like, no, it makes me so happy that yeah. like I connected to people who became best friends. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. never been like jealous of like that kind of thing. I'm like, no, they were a perfect match. I thought they were a perfect match and I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like the more I've been doing these lives, um, the connections that I have been able to make for people have been, you know, some people have started whole like CRNA group type things. So I, I love being able to make the connections um, yeah. when I do that. So yay. Yay. Um, so tell us then about your coaching. So you said you're in the life coach realm now. Yeah. So it's funny because I, I kind of stumbled upon life coaching. I've always been into self-development and like personal growth. I stumbled into life coaching when my daughter was about six months old. Somebody had talked about a podcast called Weight Loss for Busy Physicians, which had nothing to do with what I was interested in. But I started listening to her. Katrina Ubel is her name. And she kept talking about her coach and her coach. And she's like, she would say the name so fast. And one day I was like, I got to read the transcript of this show to find out who she's talking about. And so I discovered the life coach school with Brooke Castillo. And I was like, this is what I've been looking for to mm -hmm. understand. Like, how can I manage my mind? Like I have, you know, at the time I was also just starting to understand postpartum depression, postpartum rage. I was seeing a therapist. Like I knew I had the tools. I knew the issues, but I was like, I, I also like want to know what to do when I know I have the answer, but I can't find it. Mm. And so I got very interested in the life coach school. And the premise of the life coach school is that they use a tool called the model. And the model is very simplistic, but it's very in depth. And so the, how the model works is that everything in life is a circumstance. If you can prove it in court, it's a circumstance. So if I say, you know, you have a lavender shirt, I can prove that in court, it's a circumstance. If I say you have a beautiful shirt, it's not a circumstance, it's a thought mm -hmm. that, that I have. So we have a thought for every circumstance that we go through. So we have a thought about what things people say to us. We have thoughts about our actions. And so when you have a thought, you have a feeling that comes with that thought. It's either a positive feeling or a negative feeling. And I don't even like to label emotions positive or negative because it adds a lot of layers to it. But anyway, with, with that feeling, what you feel about the, the, the thought, right? you take action or you don't take action. So you either do something or you avoid doing something. And every action or inaction has a result. So for example, with your like your population, right? Your, your SRNA and your like CRNA school is hard, right? So the circumstances that you're a student and that's a fact, you can prove that in court, it's neither positive nor negative. 
when you have the thought that it's hard, and even in the application period when people are like, it's so difficult, it's so difficult, you cannot have an empowering thought from the feeling that something is difficult, right? Because the first thing that comes up is like apprehension or frustration. When you're frustrated, you don't take positive action, right? Mm -hmm. You most likely will, you know, procrastinate or you'll be afraid of enduring shame. You will do so many things that look productive, but they're not. And the mm -hmm. result is, again, going back to the thoughts, getting into CRNA school is difficult. The thought will be, it will be difficult. The result will be, it will be difficult for you to get into CRNA school. Yes. Your thought line of your model always reflects your results, right? And so I started thinking about how does that apply in motherhood? How does that apply mm -hmm. in marriage? How does that apply in being a working mom, right? And what I started to realize is, I had to so intentionally be aware of the things that I was thinking in order to have the results that I wanted, right? Like we all talk about manifesting and we all talk about the life that we want, but what we don't talk about is that it's not the actions that we do that produce those results, right? It's the thoughts that we're thinking about ourselves. It's the thoughts that we continue to feed into. So it goes again, like when you think about when you have thoughts that are moving you in forward momentum, right? when you're, you will never avoid negative emotion, right? But when you're so aware of it, it's like, wow, it's here, I feel it. Many of my clients come to me and they're afraid of feeling shame. And I say to them, what's the worst thing that could happen if you have shame, right? And it's like mind blowing to them because they've never thought about it. It's like, yeah. oh, wait, it's just an emotion. Yes. The worst thing that can happen is an emotion. And they're like, oh. So for me, when I got into that, I was like, I have to like, distill it to where like I can share this with moms I can share this with especially moms in healthcare right we deal with the burden of taking care of our patients nobody is telling us how to be better parents you know society is telling us oh you have a job well who's taking care of your kid like nobody has ever asked that to my husband and so I decided you know what I am going to go on a mission and I'm going to bring every mom with me and for me, it was all also my work. I had to do my work, right? It's a constant like progression of my work, but it also helped me because the women who I coach relate to me. Yes. They relate to be in the healthcare sphere. They relate to be mothers and feeling like, okay, I have to take care of this patient. The case is getting longer, but my kid needs to be picked up from school. Yes. Or I'm sorry, my kid has a fever and the nanny is going to have to take care of her because I have to go take care of somebody else's kid. And so coaching for me has just really been my own growth. But the best part of it is to see my own clients grow and like to see them like flourish. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? Yeah. Because it's almost like a mom. Like I'm like, oh, look, my baby is walking, right? Because when my clients come to me, they have so much mind drama. And I like to call it drama because it's exactly that. It's just a bunch of thoughts that your brain is offering you. And you're like, oh, I don't want to think these thoughts. And I'm like, what if we just think them? Yeah. Right. And so I go away from like people affirming things that you don't believe in into actually like looking at your thoughts and being like, why is my brain offering me this information about myself? Right. I remember very clearly. And this was even before I became a coach. I have a friend, Teresa, and she was applying to CRNA school. And she said to me, well, somebody told me that it's very hard to get into that school if you're a student of color. And I go, you know what? You're not going to get into that school. And she was like, what do you mean? I go, why are you even applying there if you believe that, you know, being a student of color is, is it's impossible for you to get in? She's like, well, because I'm going to give it a chance. I'm like, it's not going to work because your brain is like giving you confirmation bias that you're not going to get in. So there's nothing you're going to do that's going to prove them wrong. You're just going to prove your thoughts right. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, they didn't pick me because I'm black. And I told her, I said, if they don't pick you, I will guarantee you it's not because you're black. Right. But your energy that you delivered, delivered. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like you, you cannot create a, res a positive result from a thought that you're not good enough or you're not worthy of something. Right. Because if you think I'm not good enough, again, your result line will always mm -hmm. be, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And you will just put yourself. It's like people who are afraid of rejection, right? Everything they do creates more rejection in their life. And they're like, everybody's rejecting me. And it's like, no, when you have proved to yourself that you're not worthy, 
you continue to put out that in the world. And I always share the idea of like, if you're driving down the road and you see a red Maserati and you haven't seen one in a long time, I guarantee you by Friday of that week, you will have seen 10 more. Yes. Right, because your brain, brain is, is looking. always looking. Yes. Your brain is always looking for evidence. And so one of the other tools I use is the idea of like understanding the human motivational triad. It's the way our primitive brain was raised. Like we were raised, we lived in caves, right? We snuck out once in a while to find berries and fruits and, you know, the occasional animal and hunt the occasional animal. But every time we left the cave, there might be a leopard or a tiger, an animal that would attack us. So our primitive brain developed to avoid pain, seek pleasure and conserve energy. So every time you find yourself in a situation, for example, it's application season and you're trying to apply to school and your brain is always offering you like, oh, put that off, let's go watch a movie or, you know, let's, let's go on Facebook. Your brain is trying to conserve energy. And so one of the things I share is like, stop acting like something is wrong with you because you want to procrastinate. There's nothing wrong with you. It's who you are, yeah. right? It's your primitive energy. So what you have to do is be like, oh, my brain is offering me the thought that we need to conserve energy, but this is why I need to remind my brain, hey, we don't live in a cave anymore. It's fine. I can go do the hard thing and then I will have energy later. And so just like hacking that system is so productive for so many people because they suddenly realize there's nothing wrong with them, right? We are walking around thinking we're flawed. We're walking around thinking like we need a fix. And it's like every answer, every solution is literally between your ears. Every answer, like my clients will come to me and like, I want to do this thing, but how? And I'm like, it's not the how, like, and my own coach calls it a how greed or being a how hole, like quit being a how hole. Like, people <laughs> are like, but how do you get into CRA school? Tell me your path, tell me your path. And it's like, no, who do you have to become to succeed as a CRA, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Who do you need to be? Like, how do you show up? Like, okay, now imagine you're a CRA. Like, how are you showing up? Like, what kind of books are you reading? What kind of conversations are you having? Yeah. Right? What kind of drama are you not allowing yourself to get into? If you are in that energy, I guarantee you, you will not need to figure out the how. And so that for me has been so passionate because again, the model does not only apply, of course, to working moms or moms in medicine, it applies to everybody. And so it's so easy for me to just like, re for somebody to see something that I post that has nothing to do with, you know, being a CRNA, but they're like, oh, that makes so much sense to me because <laughs> it's the idea that every, every result in your life starts with a thought. Yeah. It's so, the same thing. So I do coaching as well. Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing that I tell to my coaching clients, you know, they all want to be CRNAs or advance to their next level. I said, but if you don't think that I'm doing this work on myself as well as a businesswoman, as an entrepreneur. Yes, yes I've done the CRNA part, but every level is going to require a new version of you. So, 100%. If I'm still, you know, if I'm still thinking, oh, but, you know, um, there's not a lot of Black um, business women or, you know, who, who walks away from, you know, the safe security of one job to go and be an entrepreneur. Like if I have all these thoughts coming up, that's exactly how my business is going to show up. Yes. You know? And yes. so, you know, I'm like, you know, ladies, like we do a lot of subconscious, you know, work and journaling and things like that. And so I'm like, you know, please don't think that you're done once we're, we're done with this coaching, you need to go no. back for each level and redo this work. I'm still doing it myself, you know? Absolutely. It's my like, own coach, like yeah, my own coach, Brig, she's a CRNA too, and she actually just left her anesthesia career completely. She's doing amazing work. And she's told me recently, she goes, Shira, there is no exit lane from the life experience, right? Like, mm -hmm. we think like you're going to be on this highway, and now you're like successful, and you're like, you're doing great. Like, you'll never experience like, oh, somebody said something that hurt my feelings and now I'm like, the world is over, right? You'll always have that. The difference between you and the person who hasn't done the work is that you have the tools, right? Yeah. So you can sit yourself down and be like, okay, bring it down five notches. <laughs> like, calm down, right? Yeah. Amanda is like, I know she's, she's responding to this because last week we had like this text conversation where I'm like, bring it down five notches, Amanda. <laughs> and yeah. because it's like, of course, for her to show up for her students, she has to have managed her own mind, right? And so if we all walk around, like showing the people we coach or people we help, like, oh, we're so perfect, we are infallible, of course, they're going to be like, I can't relate to that person, right? Yeah. When we share our own struggles and go, hey, 
I go through self-doubt. I go through feeling shame. I go through like fear of showing up. I don't want to show up, right? When our people can see that and they're like, oh, but she manages it so I can get there. Mm-hmm. That is when we become relatable, right? But th- it's never going to be like, I, I, I get so frustrated when people are like, well, when I become a CRNA, I'm going to be this. I'm like, no, no, no. You're going to become a CRNA and a new level of drama is going to show up, right? Mm-hmm. So you yeah. have to be so aware. And I have a coworker. She's so amazing. Her name is Melanie. She's like new levels, new devils, right? Yeah. Every new level you get to in your life when you're up leveling your life, there will always be a different set of drama. The difference between yesterday you and today you is like that drama is just like, oh, it's a challenge. Like, oh, how can I navigate this? as the person I am today? And also, how can I show up in a way that I know is reflective of who I am as my highest self, right? Because sometimes it's really like almost fake it till you make it where you're like, let me practice being that person. Let me practice being my highest self. Like when my husband says something really ridiculous, and I'm like, I want to be petty. Or I want to have peace, right? Like, I always say like, do I want peace? Or do I want to be right? I still have to practice it because I'm like, oh gosh, I really, the petty option is the easy option, right? Mm -hmm. But I share that with my own clients because I don't want them to think like, oh, she's like handling marriage perfectly. She's handling her toddler screaming cat perfectly, right? I want them to be aware like, hey, I go through this every day and this is how I manage my mind, right? And for me, when like, when we talk about the mismade mnemonic, my machine, my M is my own mindset, like checking my brain every day, like doing self coaching, because I'm like, once I check this machine, everything else flows, right? When I check this machine, and Amanda, again, is testament of this, when you check your own brain, and your mind is managed, it doesn't matter if the drama was outside of your business, right? When you show up with drama, like something happened at work, you can't show up in your business 100%. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to manage those aspects because then you show up and you're like, oh, because there's no compartments. Like we like to think about life as, oh, this is marriage compartment over here, motherhood over here, job over here. No, when my boss like, you know, says something that upsets me, I go and like take that out of my kid or my husband. Right. So I have to manage this drama of my boss before I get home so that my kid and my husband or my business or my coaching clients don't have to experience that negative energy right and so it's so important for us to be like hey we all go through this mind drama it's just that we have tools and we're practicing those tools and like everything in life is literally like bathing we have to do it every day right checking your mind I, I tell my coaching clients it's like washing your brain you have to like look at your brain and be like oh that part is really dirty like I need to like scrub it I need to bleach it it's your own brainwashing because this is the only thing that produces the results we have in our life. And I just wish so many people were so aware instead of being like, but how do I do it? But how did you become successful? But how did you do this? It's like, you know, who did you have to become? Yes, beforehand. And what Before. did you have to address? What did you have to shine light on? What did you have yes. to um, do the shadow work on and bring to light that you didn't even know was there? Um, my coach who I worked with, uh, last year, she's, she was a CRNA as well. That's so funny. Um, and she's, she's full on coaching now as well, but I wonder if it's the same person. <laughs> um, she's in North Carolina. Okay. She's in Texas. Different okay. person. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's just amazing. Once you start shining the light on those aspects of yourself that you may not e- even have known were there. And then it's like these aha moments that you have. You're like, Oh my, like for me, I tell my coaching clients all the time for relationships. The reason why I kept dating the same type of man over and over and over again was because of the shadow aspects that I had in my energy field. I had no idea they were there, but when I shined the light on them, when I dropped down like, into this brain and the meditations and figured it all out, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, no wonder I date. It's the same person. <laughs> <laughs> it's the yeah. same guy. And so. Yeah. Um, Literally, you're like, oh, like when you go into self-shaming behavior and you're like, why am I so hard on myself? I literally like make my clients go deep into like, tell me about six-year-old you. And they're yes. like, Oh, yes. that's where it came from, right? Yeah. Yes. Because we, and we don't own our shame stories. And so yes. again, we have to be, and I think especially for women, I, it probably happens even more in men, but for women, I think there's this aspect of shame that we feel like we own our shame. Even if the shame was things that were done to us, 
we kind of like give ourselves responsibility like hey it's not your fault like your parents like were like a certain way it's not your fault that you got in a relationship that yeah. was not supportive of who you are as a person you have to forgive that person yeah and then be like oh it's not my fault i don't have to carry the shame along but it's like one of the reasons we don't want to show up one of the reasons we don't want to talk about our struggles one of the reasons we're not vulnerable is because we carry our shame stories yes. and sometimes i'm like what if you just share the story and then everybody's like oh i went through that too and it's like oh see there was nothing to hide from yeah yeah it's so true like the the epigenetics you know, even some of the stuff that we carry that's not even ours, you know, yeah. um, going back layers and layers and layers of DNA wise. And, um, you know, I, I tell my clients, you know, we, we do a lot of childhood work as well. And I said, love, love on that little girl, whoever she was, yeah. the youngest you can remember her. She needs you. She needs you now. She needs to know she's safe and she's loved and it's not her fault. And she's just, you know, like, it's okay to go back and do those things. And it may sound so like somebody may say, that sounds ridiculous. Like, how can yeah. that help them? Like, yeah. Try it. It does. <laughs> well, and the other thing too is like, I know I'm guilty of it, of running away from doing the inner child work because it's, it's not easy work, right? Because yeah. then you have to address like, oh, what happened to you at that point and like what you were thinking. But there's so much growth in it because for me, a lot of the times it's fear of rejection or fear of abandonment or fear yeah. of failing. And many of us, especially high achieving women, we become the way we are and we become perfectionists because we want to be accepted yes. because we haven't owned our shame story. And so owning your shame story doesn't mean now you're like, oh, everybody knows my story. It's like, oh, now I understand like why criticism affects me a certain way. I understand myself. And it's so like liberating, especially yeah. in marriage and relationships where you're like, you know, when my husband says this thing, it's actually not an attack. <laughs> because right? it's like oh I realize now why that affects me so much yeah. when he's wiping the kitchen counter and I'm like he thinks I'm a mess and yeah. it's like no he's just wiping the kitchen counter like yeah. like talk to that little girl and tell her it's okay that he spilled milk on the counter right but yeah. we have to be also aware of how we are normalizing these conversations because I don't think that they're where we need to be and 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 that's why I share a lot of like my own shame and my own struggles because I want people to be aware like hey even those of us that have quote unquote appear to have made it we still have struggles absolutely and those struggles you know um they're gonna sh so so I tell my clients okay you want to be a CRNA fine what happens when you do get in and you show up to clinical as the person that you are now prior to doing the work so you have fear you have shame you're you're scared you're nervous and you get that preceptor who senses it because they sense it mm -hmm. and it's not a nice preceptor it's not somebody who's gonna you know love on you and you know show you the ropes it's that preceptor who's like oh i'm gonna get this one kicked out so you have to be very aware of what your energy is carrying and what you're projecting so getting in is one thing staying in and succeeding and passing boards totally separate so and I should... even if you skate through that and get into a crna position then you have the one co-worker yes or surgeon or yes. or attending yeah anybody yeah mm -hmm. and then like i look back at like the first three years of my career Man, I was so easily triggered, right? Because yeah. it was like every critique, every question felt like, oh, dear. it's like an imposter, right? Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, I've been found out. Like, I remember asking my program director, like, did you take me because I was black? Like, <laughs> and he was just like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> right? But like, even those first years where I was like, am I really smart? Or do people just tell me that so I feel better about myself? Like when you haven't managed that level of your brain, of course that crap is going to show up and you're going to be like, see, gotcha. I told you, you're about to be found out. Yeah. 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 And imposter syndrome. I'm actually writing a book about it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an ugly thing. Yeah. And you know, one thing I actually learned from my uh, business mentor, Stacey Bayman, is like, she actually calls it success intolerance. I actually, uh, I think next week, the podcast is coming out next week on my podcast is about, or maybe it was today. But it talks about like, we talk about imposter syndrome as if it's like this thing, right? But sometimes it's actually a reflection of how we don't tolerate success. 
We don't mm-hmm. think we're worthy of success. And so when it comes, you're like, when is the other shoe going to drop? Where am I going to be found out? Be- then you start self-sabotaging, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not always them sabotaging you. So you're like, oh, I'm going to be found out. So I might as well like call off tomorrow, right? Like it's, it starts like sneaking in on you. And it's like the same way many of us are afraid of failure. We're equally afraid of success. Because again, we haven't seen people like us in positions of power, right? Yeah. So we're like, of course, they're going to be like, oh, she's a fraud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that fraud complex is like, oh, get out of here. You don't belong here. Mm-hmm. You think you're a businesswoman? You think your stuff is at Walmart? That was a fluke. Sorry. Yes. They're going to take it away from you. Listen, yes. Right? Listen, yeah. I have had, uh, yes, like I said, yeah. I'm still doing the work on myself. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, yeah. Or like somebody says one little thing, they're like, wow, Walmart. And you're like, what are they thinking? I don't deserve to be at Walmart. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. I'm currently listening to um, Jamie Cur- uh, Kern Lima's book, Believe It. She's the founder of It Cosmetics. I love and her. she talks about like going to like Sephora and they're like, mm, no. But she also said something that was so profound to me. She goes, she didn't attach emotion to the people who told her no when they did. Right. So when she came and rose to the top, she went back to those people and they said yes to her. And I Mm -hmm. think that's such a profound lesson for many of us because the people along the way that are the naysayers and the, and the people that talk us out of it, we want to go back and be like, see, I made it. But she was like, no, actually those were the business connections that she used. Cause I've had people in my own life, like, why do you want to be a coach? Like, aren't you making enough money as a CRNA? And I'm like, it's not about making money. I could pick up a whole bunch of shifts. Right. But I love what I do and I love helping women. And yeah. to me, it's like God's work, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. When my client texts me and she tells me her marriage is better and she's not yelling at her kids, I'm like, that's a whole generation of yeah. children that's going to grow up without a mother yeah. that yells at them, right? Yeah. That is more profound than one general anesthetic. Thank you very much. Yes. Right? Yes. And I'm always like, your brain created that. Like for me, the biggest work is like telling my client, your own brain created that result. I just helped you see your blind spots. That's it. So mm-hmm. I had a recently, I had a consult with um, somebody that's in CRNA school and her consultation was actually not even related to being in CRNA school. It was just like other drama. And when we got off the call, she was still hesitant. And when we got off the call, I just felt like, like this, this pull on my heart because I was like, I wish she knew how much this work will not only help her in her personal life, but also as a student and going forward. So one thing for me is like when people say no to me on consults, I'm not sad about the potential lost revenue, right? Because I'm like, somebody else is going to walk through the doors and want to do a consult. But I'm sad that I didn't get the chance to show them how amazing they can be. And that is like the thing, like when, if you're ever, like any of anybody listening, if you're ever in a situation where you have the opportunity to change your life and you walk away from it, I want you to just think about like the potential, like even when people talk about the money it costs to be a, like to get a coach, I'm like, that is so small compared to the profound changes in your life that it's never about the money. Yeah, it's it right. because because it's an investment. It's an investment in yourself. It's an investment in your life. It's an investment in your family's life. If Absolutely. you're married, or yeah. even if you're not married, I mean, um, you know, me beginning to coach was 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 never in the plans really. Yeah. But when I started working with my coach and you know invested in making myself a better individual and I'm a CRNA and I have a business and I you know I've paid off all these that I have all these things but I still had I still had stuff, you know, I yeah. still had life stuff. Yeah. You and still so, have my drama. Right. And so it's truly an investment in showing up and wor- doing the work and showing up as your most authentic, whole, worthy, loving self. And there, there's really no amount of money that you can put. No. That's priceless. And I, think, and I think for many of us, especially in our industry, right, like we are very result oriented as far as like financial gain, right? Many people who are in CRNA school want to become CRNAs, level up, make more money. I think when those people are faced with the decision to manage their mind, they're like, but what's the ROI, right? Because it's not a tangible result. But the ROI is so much more than like the immediate result, right? And again, like when I talk to my clients who are also in business, half the time we, I don't, I'm not a business coach, right? 
But when they come back to me and go, oh, I negotiated this raise, right? Like one of my clients negotiated a 12% raise, negotiated more academic time for her, not academic time for herself. I'm like, that is the ROI, right? Yeah. Because you have managed your mind where you're not showing up to talk to your boss with mind drama and you can be like, hey, listen, this is what I'm worth. So for me, like sharing that with people, I'm like, it's not, it's never about the money. Cause again, people, especially CRNA, CRNA is like nice things, right? Like we go and spend tons of money on many things, but I'm like, those things are not going to change your life. I can guarantee you. Yeah. But yeah. a managed mind will not only change your life, it will give you the potential to even make more money. Yes. Yeah. And change other people's lives. Yes. Whether you're yes. actively trying to or not. Or yeah. not. Because again, and this is another thing I share with my clients especially those who are married when they're like, I'm trying to change. My husband doesn't want to change. I'm like, listen, when you start changing, they have no choice but to come mm -hmm. along. Yeah. Right. Because nobody wants to be the person in the relationship that's not pulling their weight if they're invested in the relationship. So yeah. if they're all in and they see you changing, they're like, what are you doing differently? Yeah. That in itself is like, now you've changed another person's life by doing your own work. And then you're changing your kids' lives and you're changing the way you show up at work. People see you different, right? Like for me, I had to be very aware that I was creating a new version of me that people didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I was okay with that because mm -hmm. they were like, oh, but you know, now you're like, woo woo. I'm like, I'm not woo woo. I'm who I used to be. But now I see light in a different lens, right? And yeah. motherhood definitely changed that for me because now I have to be so clear on how I show up. But I'm like, no, I just want, this is Shira 2.0. It's okay if you're familiar with 1.0. I'm okay with that. And it's okay if you hold me to the standard of 1.0. That's on you. I'm, I'm moving yeah. forward. Like, yes. I'm changing. I'm like moving ahead. Like this year, I just made the decision actually last month to go PRN and do locums instead of being a full-time CRNA in my job. And that was so scary. And when I think about it, Shira 1.0 would have never made that decision. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so now and people are like how are you gonna make money and I'm like I'll figure it out yeah it'll come yeah it'll come. Come. It'll it come. always comes it does right? mm -hmm. yeah and you know for me to like just seeing women in our space doing the things that we're doing is so empowering because we're like hey look at us there's more to life than just like going to work every day and working for somebody else right mm -hmm. and I think people really undermine the hustle of being an entrepreneur especially when we make easy money. You can pick up, you can pick, people are like, you can pick up an extra shift, right? Yeah, you can't. But you know what's free when you're like, I own my time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I show That's up when right. I show up. Yeah. yeah. And right. so I think empowering other CRNAs and people in healthcare to be like, this isn't it. Being a clinician is amazing, but we're also made to do other things if we wanted to do them. Right. Because in our community, too, there's a drama of, oh, you're W2 and I'm 1099 and da, da, da. It's like, it doesn't matter. It yeah. does not matter. But yeah. are you doing something that's meaningful work that fulfills who you are? Right. Yeah. And so going back even to the people who want to become CRNAs, this is by no means like saying, oh, don't be a CRNA because it's an amazing job. And, you know, we get paid for our value. We don't get paid for the amount of work that we do. Right. But it's still so freeing to understand that we are living in a time, especially as Black women, where we can choose our options and that we can be an example of what's possible to other women. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. when I see you, I'm like, yeah, I don't even know Crystal, like, in real life. I'm like, she's, her products are in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And like, that, and look that at is. Crystal doing the thing. Yeah. That, and yeah. that is, um. Yeah, it, it's it's a lot, you know, and and I'm sure, you know, even when I posted it, people were probably like, oh, you know, that's cool. And I'm like, you have no idea how much work that took. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, just like CRNAs, we make it look easy. You yeah. know, we, yeah. we make all of it look easy. But behind the, the scenes, there was years of schooling. There was years of studying. There was years of, you know, taking tests and C exams and, in, uh, you know, um, and BCRNA boards and all of those things. So, you know, like we said, every level, there's a different new level. Levels, new levels. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my new saying. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Melanie is one of my, she's one of our anesthetic. She's literally one of my favorite human beings because she has like these like, 
saying? She's like, do you aid and evacuate? I'm like, that's right, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one too. I already know yeah. what that means. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She is amazing. I just love her because she just brings so much energy. And we're so blessed to also be in a career where we get to interact with people from all walks of life, take yeah. care of so many different people. And I think that for me actually has been the best thing in order for me to show up as a coach because like zero judgment. Like my clients bring me all their mind drama and I just think of it as a patient with like two teeth or a patient with 32 <laughs> teeth. Like they're still my patient, right? Like they're totally my patient. Yeah. And I'm not like, oh, you have two teeth. I'm going to give you like this level of care versus you have 32 and you get this level of care. Everybody gets the same level of care and I get to learn so much from them. Yeah. 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 So and, it's totally and- like a whole new school. It is. It is. And I think that, um, you know, for me, like I tell my coaching clients, you know, up front, I'm not teaching you how to work an anesthesia machine. I'm not teaching you pathophysiology. Um, I understand all of you want to be a CRNA, but these tools and tips and exercises that we're going to do is going to help you become a better version of yourself. So, you know, this whether you become a CRNA or not, you're still going to show up as a more vibrant version of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. because it's like, it's it's not even this whole like new year, new me thing. It's like new old you 2.0. Like you have up leveled so much. Your brain, like, because sometimes I look at like my responses in the past and I'm like, yeah, that was really 1.0 thinking, right? Like almost like, when I'm like, this person made me feel this way. And like, I was giving so much energy to so many people that now I'm like, no, I had a thought about this situation. And then I felt this way. Like I own my feelings. Yes. Nobody makes you feel anyway. And it's like, boom. Because we're the creators of our reality. We create whatever is showing up in our lives. Yes. We create that. So it's it's just, it's wonderful work and it's so powerful. And I'm so glad about it like all the relationships in our lives right now all the your bank account balance everything in your life right now you created that like I think we give so much like very little ownership to our own brain especially even like a CRNA like I'll coach a mom and I'm like do you remember taking a test and like thinking you flunked CRNA school and you passed that test like your brain created that so then your brain can create anything it wants to create Mm -hmm. so if you think about your current life right now and you're like oh i need to change this thing the awareness that you can change that thing Mm -hmm. right but you have to manage your mind you can only do it from a managed mind yeah yeah so good so with that i want to ask this one last question Uh that another crna actually had um she wants to know how to stay optimistic and patient focused during these trying times So the first thing I think that is so important for us to realize is that we have for so long been human givers, right? We have given so much of ourselves and not just as CRNAs, as women, as providers, we give so much of ourselves. The most important thing is to one, I don't think that staying optimistic is real, like realistic, right? I think that being anchored in who you are and being aware that you're doing meaningful work gives you like a reason, right? optimism is very like fleeting like it can be like you're optimistic today and then tomorrow you're like the sky is falling your chicken little everything is over right so I think what is most important to realize is what truly matters to you Mm -hmm. right what truly matters is that you know for me is that I when I show up to take care of my patients I take care of them like I would my loved one right like I would want my loved one to be taken care of so when I think about like the you know the jobs like situations being bleak sometimes you know we're being asked to show up of our give so much of ourselves that sometimes we're not able to I think like at what capacity like what is my capacity right because I am not going to set myself on fire to keep other people warm right so check in with yourself check in with how you're feeling don't gratitude guilt yourself into like oh I should be grateful I don't have COVID I have a job should be optimistic There's nothing wrong with optimism, but there's a place for it and there's a place where it can be hurtful, right? When we start using it to like guilt people, when we're like, oh, just be optimistic, you know, it it starts to veer into toxic positivity. And 
So I think being anchored, the other thing for me that's so important is having a gratitude practice. Mm -hmm. I find that in the moments when I am so clear of what I'm grateful for, and my gratitude practice goes like this. I write what I'm grateful for and why. So I always write down every day, three to five things I'm grateful for and why I'm grateful for them. Mm -hmm. Because I can be grateful, like, I'll give you an example. I'm very grateful for my AirPods that go in here, right? Why am I grateful for my AirPods? Because sometimes I just want to be in the zone and I'm in a house with a three-year-old and my husband and everybody's doing their own thing. I just want to be grounded on my own, right? So yeah, it seems like something benign, but like it has noise canceling purposes. I can close my office door and not even hear what you can hear outside my door, right? So I like to have that idea of like, this is what I'm grateful for. Like, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my body. I'm grateful like for my body because it brought life into this world, right? Yeah. And I'm grateful for my brain, even when it's unmanaged, because I'm still the best version of myself this minute. So just to conclude, like, I don't want people to think like you have to stay optimistic and like woo-woo positive. But I also think like look around you and just realize that like, we still have so much to be thankful for, mm -hmm. especially living in the United States, right? We have healthcare, we have running water, we have food to eat. And not acknowledging your own pain doesn't help those who are struggling. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling emotionally in this season, pretending that you're okay is not helping the people who have COVID. It's not helping the people who have lost loved ones during the pandemic. That's comparative suffering, where you think that you're not deserving of owning your pain and your struggle because other people are struggling. We don't have a struggle Olympics, right? Nobody is winning the gold medal for having the most struggle or the least struggle. So if you're struggling, there's so many resources, yeah. right? Like DM me, DM Crystal, we'll point, we'll point you to resources, but don't struggle alone. Especially in this season, one of the books I highly, highly, highly recommend for healthcare providers is the book Burnout by doctors Emily and Emilia Nagoski. It just gives you so many actionable steps to how to recognize if you're suffering from comparative uh, compassion fatigue because you've been a human giver for so long. But mm -hmm. it also gives you one very important way of managing all the stressors, movement. Mm. Get out, walk, run, ride a bike, whatever. Movement is free unless you have a physical condition that doesn't allow you to move. And even that, sometimes you can do yoga. Just move your body. It doesn't have to be this like profound, like I'm going to the gym, I'm going to get a one hour workout. Just move your body. Like just walk, take a walk, like sit down and like be in the present moment for five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's such fulfilling work. So mindfulness, movement and gratitude. If there's anything you're going to do, move your body. Yes. Oh my God. I love that. I, so I, um, today has been a very rough day for me. I have some family stuff going on and, um, I was not able to get my business stuff done. Yeah. So, um, Sorry about that. no, it, you know what? Oh, like, it's life. <laughs> yep. It's life. Yeah. And yeah. because I have the tools. So immediately, as soon as I felt myself getting like, Oh my God, like I, I can't handle this. This is so much. I was like, we need to go outside. It's cold. Yes, it's cold. It's winter yeah. time. But we need to go outside. We need to look at some trees. And literally, that is what I did. I got, put the dogs on the leash, um, put my jacket on, and um, we just walked. We walked. I looked at the trees. The trees don't have any leaves on them. But you know what that meant for me? That's, the, that's their season. That's their, their season. season. Yeah. yeah. And the leaves are going to grow back. And they're going to be beautiful in a few months. And so the more that I was out in nature, and I, I do this every day, but today I really needed, like, to, like, stop the, the, the mind drama, you know? And yeah. as soon as I walked back in the house, I just, I felt so much better. I ground, I was grounded again, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, and, and I was thinking about that person's question too. Like, if you think about like, when we're in situations where like your patient's bleeding, like massively bleeding, right? That is not the time where we stop and think, am I okay? Am I okay? Right? We go, 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 go. Right. But when it's over, we always take the time to be like, okay, check in with myself. How am I doing? Right? So even though these seasons, like just imagine this being like a code situation, there will be a point that you have to force yourself to like stop and check in with yourself. Ask yourself, like literally, how are you feeling? Right? Because I can't, I can't ask you how you're feeling and, I, and be sure that I'll get the exact answer. But you can be like, Crystal, are you okay? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then just being like, I'm feeling sadness, I'm feeling whatever feeling, put a name to it, 
and just like sit in that moment and be like, I'm feeling sad. How would you comfort a friend if they said they were sad? Yeah. And allow that for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, one of the things I realized is a lot of us don't even know how to articulate emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad they asked that question because that is, a lot of us are struggling right now. And I did a, I did a podcast episode. It wasn't really geared to everybody, but it was like, why is nobody talking about, you know, the effect of the pandemic on moms? But it was that idea of like, people have just like reached their saturation point. Yeah. And we don't see an end in sight. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's literally, um, it's changed all of us in yeah. a very short amount of time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I joke, I, I'm like, I used, I'm, I'm, I'm a bona fide extrovert, but I feel like COVID made me more introverted than I ever thought I would ever be. Yeah. And, and again, you know, like my best friend lost her dad last week and mm -hmm. I was struggling with wanting to travel home and, and being there for her. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I hate COVID. And I like literally verbalized that. And I was like, did I just say that? And I was like, yeah. Because I would love to get on a plane and not have to like have P PCR testing and do all these things and actually be a human being and be there for my best friend. And that's not possible right now. Yeah. So of course I'm going to grieve that, but I'm also going to be grateful that like I'm, I'm in the position to be able to buy a plane ticket or spend that money and support my friend's family. Right. So I, I'm going to end like saying there's something that uh, Robin uh, Arzon said on the right. She was like, you can hold up gratitude and grief at the same time. And I think a lot of struggling with that. We can be grateful and still feel the grief of what the pandemic has done. I love that. Who said that? Robin, Arz uh, Robin Arzon on Peloton. She's one of my, okay. my favorite Peloton instructors. Yeah. But oh. She said it. It's like so profoundly. I was like, yes, so true. Like, we don't have to like separate them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This was good. Yes. I thank like, you. I like unscripted conversations because I'm like, we never know where it's going to go. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I feel like we still hit some very key points and whoever yeah. needed the message will get the message, you know, like yes. that's the great thing yeah. about these. So, and I already yeah, feel sure. better. Like I was feeling a little, you know, oh, tired. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I feel better. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we were able to organize this and I'd love to come back anytime. Thank yes, you, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a good night and be safe. Thank you, Crystal. All thank right. Thank you. Yeah. I gotta go back to my other job now. Back time. <laughs> Your mama job. <laughs> All right. Yes. yes. Bye. Bye, Bye, Crystal. Bye. Good night. Bye.